Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Training Centers for Exorcism. We are on class number 44, session 44. And today we're going to be talking again about hell, a very real place in the Bible. Let's open with prayer. Holy Spirit, it is our prayer that you come into this teaching session and you reveal yourself to God's people. We pray that the truth of your scriptures and your word would be alive and well to help each and every person understand what you're saying to us in this hour about hell, how to help people, how to help ourselves, and how to grow and be in. And Father, we pray that as this teaching is going forward, that your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Class 44 is going to deal with some very specific places that are mentioned in hell. The Bible in regards to what we know about the place called hell. We're going to be talking about Gehenna today, Tartarus, Hades, and Sheol, which I think you'll find a lot of interest in. And it's very good to understand these different terms and definitions. Now, what you're going to see today is Sheol and Hades are references to a place that's a holding place. Hades being the reference from, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Let's start out with Gehenna. This is the hell that everybody knows about. It's the uh, word number 1067 in the Greek. It's Gehenna, hell. The place or state of the lost and condemned. Um, looking at verses Matthew 25, 29 and 30. Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 23, 15, and James 3, 6. It talks about this place of being lost and condemned. Let's look at Matthew 5, 29 to 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell and hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Amen. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Amen. Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. James 3, 6, again, that hell being the hell of Gehenna, the place or state of being lost and condemned. James 3, 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members, that it defiles the whole body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by Gehenna, hell. Gehenna represents, in the Hebrew, Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, also called, also called Ge ben Hinnom, the valley of the son of Hinnom. And that references Joshua 15, 8, and Joshua 18, 16. The corresponding Aramaic word, ye, ye, and them, G E H I N N A M. Joshua 15 8 says, And the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom to the southern slope of the Jebusite city, which is Jerusalem. The border went up to the top of the mountain that lies before the valley of Hinnom, westward, which is at the end of the valley of Raphael, northward. Joshua 18 16. Then the border came down to the end of the mountain that lies before the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is in the valley of the Rephaim, on the north, descended to the valley of Hinnom, to the side of the Jebusite city, on the south, and descended to Enrobo. Now, according to ChristianFaith.com, all authorities admit this word, Gehenna, is derived from the name of the narrow, rocky valley of Hinnom, this south of Jerusalem, where trash, filth, and the bodies of dead animals were burned up in Bible days. Here's a quote from Bible Facts by Jenny Roberts. 
Gehenna meant the Valley of Henna and was originally a particular valley outside of Jerusalem, where children were sacrificed to the god Moab. And he referenced 2 Kings 23.10, 2 Chronicles 28.3, and Jeremiah 32.35. In later Jewish literature, Gehenna came to be associated with a place of torment and unquenchable fire that was to be punishment for sinners. It was thought by many that lesser sinners might eventually be delivered from the fires of Gehenna, but by New Testament times, punishment for sinners was deemed to be eternal. And listen, listening to that, based upon that, you can understand where some people say um, there's, there are different denominations who believe that hell is the temporary place and you get a chance, you get a second chance to redo things and you can you know, purgatory, you, you, can, um, you can offer sacrifices for those who have passed on. So this is already starting out in the early early days. There was a little bit of miscommunication, a little bit of, oh, we can't send anybody to hell, kind of teaching going on. So it's, it's no wonder that it's, it's transpired all the way up until today. So we can kind of see where that comes from. Jesus Christ spoke about Gehenna many times, such as in Matthew 5, 22, 29, and 30, where he warned about the danger of hell, Gehenna, fire. Matthew 5, 22. Gehenna definitely suggests real flames. Gehenna means a place of fire, brimstone, and punishment. These flames are yet future at the end of the world. In his description of this final fire, and the doom of the wicked are lost. The Bible declares, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this is according to Revelation 20, verse 15. So this is the place that we all know and have, have heard, have preached to us about, have even read about the scripture, you know, about the place of being condemned and, and tortured, you know, for your sins. Let's look at 2 Kings 23.10. 2 Kings 23.10. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Moab. 2 Chronicles 28.3. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burned his children in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Second Chronicles 33, 6. It also talks. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Think about some of these things that we just read. These are also going to be the things that people will be doing in hell. They're going to be practicing their sins, and the demons are going to be tormenting them there while they're there. Jeremiah 7, 31-32. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. Um, there's another scripture that's in the Bible that says that hell is enlarging itself constantly, daily. And that's something that, in the heart of a believer, you should really be having that same compassion, the same desire as far as the Lord to stop people from burning in hell. It's so very important in this time period that we have compassion for those who are lost. We have compassion for those who are hurting so that we do not forget this in their walk and in their time and their season so that they can come to know the Lord. We have a responsibility to bring them out of this place to make sure that they don't go to this place of hell. Jeremiah 32, 35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, 
to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, when you look at this term, Gehenna, the terms descriptive of hell are found in Matthew 13, 42, 25, 46, Philippians 3, 19, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, Hebrews 10, 39, 2 Peter 2, 17, Jude 1, 13, Revelation 2, 11, Revelation 19, 20, Revelations 26, Revelations 20, verse 10, Revelations 14, and then Revelations 21, 6. These terms are also descriptive of the word Tartarus, which is, we kind of talked about this in sessions 42 and 43, where if God held the angels to a high account, and made a place for them, you know, he is definitely going to hold us accountable for the things that we do. But Tartarus specifically refers to the place where the angels and the, the demonic angels, the angels who fell, are going to be tortured and uh, punished for the things that they did. Tartarus is the Greek word 50-20. It's Tartaro. <laughs> It's found only in its verbal form in 2 Peter 2 4, meaning to consign to Tartarus, which is neither Sheol of the Old Testament nor Hades of the New Testament. It's not Gehenna, not hell, but the place where certain angels are confined, reserved unto judgment. This punishment for these angels is because of their special sin. And we probably will get into that until, until later teaching. But this is just so you see that the Bible is very descriptive on how it, I always like to think of it like this. There's, there's a lot of people who want to pick the Bible apart and say that, you know, it's just a, a, a bunch of stories, you know, it's a bunch of funny little things that, that really don't have any order. And they even went so far as to try to create something called the, uh, It's, I'm calling it the opposite of the Bible code, but they, they took the Gnostic Gospels and they made fun of the real Bible, the real Gospels, and they took this, the Da Vinci Code is what I'm trying to think of. They took the Bible codes and they came up with something called the Da Vinci Codes. There's no way to top what's inside of this Bible. When you look at it in the, in the Greek and the Hebrew, for them to be able to put it mathematically into a computer and come up with your name, you know, your, your children's names, your family's names, you absolutely cannot top that. So, you know, when you look at the different things that are going on in the world to try to debunk the Bible, it's 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 unheard of. But back to my, my point is that God is a God of order, just like he has the angels in order. He has hell in order. There are different regions in heaven. There are different structures that he has set up um, in the spiritual realm. You know, the demonic forces, they have a copycat version of, of order because, you know, Satan copycats everything that, that the Father does. So, as, as we get into the rest of this tonight, you're going to see that the Old Testament version of Sheol is the New Testament version of Hades. And this gets this gets really kind of deep because when you look at Sheol and Hades as we go through this, you're going to see that it was a holding place for both the good people and the bad people. We're going to learn, according to the Bible, that everyone goes to Hades slash Sheol. I know that this comes as a complete shock to you, and I see all of you reaching for your holy oil to come and get me, but you, you don't need it. This, this is scripturally saying, <laughs> 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 
There are many truths in the Bible that we just didn't take the time to really research them out. We have heard other people tell us about these things, and it sounds really good, but the reality is they did not finish studying these items in applying scripture with scripture and taking the verses in their full context. So the aim of this teaching is to try to give you a firm biblical footing on which to minister to God's people. So what we know, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And he has been given power and authority over hell. That is the, the hell that is going to be known as Hades and Sheol. And it's also going to be the hell that's known as Gehenna and Tartarus. You know, the places of punishment for us as people, and the places of punishment for the angels, the devils, the, the, the angels and the devil's angels. As believers, we have that right to understand and to walk in the power and authority that Jesus Christ has given us. Our adoption into the family of God gets us the ability to walk in this power and authority. As a minister of exorcisms, we're learning to walk under that power and authority, and we're learning to use this dominion over the works of the enemy and the souls of the people with whom we are working. As we have stated in previous classes, knowing about hell and how it is set up will give you tools necessary to affect change in the hearts of God's people. We're going to go to Revelations chapter 1, verses 17 to 18 next. Revelations chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, some translations of the Bible improperly translate Hades as hell. When we look at this passage, this is the Apostle John as he is born into the spirit realm. John is having a visitation, and Jesus appears to him and tells John, among other things, that he has the keys of Hades and death. Hades is not another word for hell. I want to be clear about this. As you look in the New Testament Greek, Hades is a term that means the following. It's the region of departed souls of the lost but it also includes the departed believers. It's the region of the departed souls of the lost, but it also includes the departed believers. And let's look at Luke chapter 16. I think this will help you see where we're going and how this really plays out. Luke chapter 16, verses, I'm going to start at verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now the hell that they're talking about is this Hades. Even though they translated it in the English Bible as hell, it actually means Hades. So, both Lazarus and this poor man are in this waiting place. So you have Lazarus who is unrighteous and this poor man who is righteous by God's standards. They're both sitting around in this waiting place. Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But 
Abraham says, son, remember that you in your lifetime received not your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they would pass from hence to you, cannot. Let me read verse 26 again. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear him not, Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, no one rose from the dead. That was Luke chapter 16 verses 19 to 31. Key things here. Both of these people were dead. Both of these people were in Hades. In the wrestling. And it, this really kind of transforms your thinking. It doesn't necessarily say that the poor man saw Lazarus, but it does say that Lazarus saw poor man. Think about that as well. Now Lazarus, you can clearly see here, is being tormented in this place by the things that he's done. Um, Brother Brett often tells about a testimony that he had when God gave him a vision where he's, he was before the throne and he saw the different things that he did and he saw how he could have made different decisions and different choices and it was it was it was live in real time happening before him. So I'm not saying exactly what Brother Brett saw, but this seems like a similar situation for Lazarus. He's sitting there waiting because this isn't his final judgment. The, the, the scriptures are clear. Hades in this particular reference is not Lazarus's final judgment, but it is a place where he's waiting around, thinking about everything that he's done. You know, one is some relief, one is some some, some relief from the torment and the pressure that he's enduring because now he knows there's, there's no coming back from where where he's at. So much so that he even is trying to get the, 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 the poor man to go be sent back and they said no. Abraham says no. He can't be sent back. So there's some distinguishing here that needs to be made and, and leveled out. Once you cross that line once that silver cord is cut on your life, you cannot come back on the side of the earth. So, once you leave here, both good and both bad, enter into this realm, this region, this place called Hades. I was in shock when I read this as well. The funny part is that in my mind, I went to some crazy places. I can tell all my backslidden brothers and sisters, hey, guess what I read in the Bible? We are all going to Hades. <laughs> it's kind of a crazy thought, but uh, it should stir up some conversations and maybe, maybe we can win them over, get them back on our side. I know that this would blow their minds, but it's the truth. Everyone, when they pass on into eternity, goes into this place called Hades. Let's keep going because I know the religious spirits are out there shooting witchcraft at me right now. Please keep your computer on. Don't turn your computer off because there's more. The most probable derivation of Hades is from Hado, all receding. It corresponds to Sheol in the Old Testament. Let's look at Sheol for a little bit. Old Testament would be Hebrew. The Hebrew word 70, 
7585 shield, depth, abyss, the nether world, the realm of dead people, the world of the dead, like a subterranean retreat, the final resting place of everyone. Scripture reference would be Job 21.13. The grave, the pit, Hades, or hell. When they say hell, there's a difference from the hell of Gehenna. Their Bible scholars call Gehenna the ultimate hell, where your final judgment has been distributed to you, and you'll receive it, your rewards for what you did here on this earth. The King James Version translates Sheol as grave 31 times. So when you see that, Sometimes in the Old Testament scriptures, when you're reading them, you really kind of need to dig into the source of, the, of that word to make sure that you're interpreting it correctly. King James Version translates Sheol as grave 31 times, hell 30 times, and pit 3 times. The American Standard Version and the Revised Standard Versions transliterate the word as Sheol. The NIV has grave, but with a footnote. Although many grammarians, like Decimius, believe that this word was derived from the idea of asking shale, 7592, that is demanding that everyone without distinction be in this hollow place, the actual etymology is uncertain. Except for the Jewish elephantine papyri, where it means grave. And that's just a, um, another word or term where they used, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and they, they found an exact copy in these papyri. Sheol does not appear outside of the Hebrew Old Testament. It simply meant the place of the dead. Though a future life is affirmed in the Old Testament, the details are sketchy. The Hebrew scriptures do not delineate the intermediate state and destiny of the wicked, but the resurrection of righteous people is clearly assured. And don't know, maybe we'll find out in heaven why God allowed them to not talk about so much of the negative side in the Old Testament as far as regards to being in Hades, but it's, there's nothing there. doesn't mean that they didn't understand it and was it was, uh, it was not something that was promoted, but they just didn't talk about it. Both, when you look at that, that word Sheol in the, in the Old Testament and Hades in the New Testament, the New Testament really goes into more about the punishment side. And we'll see that as we go on. But both good men, Genesis 35, and evil men, Numbers 1630, go to Sheol. Genesis 37, 35. This is Joseph, and all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Here Joseph is telling his sons that when he dies, he will go down into Sheol. Number 1630, but if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Same word, Sheol. So this is the evidence of an evil person being sent into Sheol, the world of the dead. When I think about this, I get a sense that they were afraid about this place. Sheol, because they didn't really know what went on there. All the people really knew was that they were absent from this life, this world that we live in. I'm saying all of this to say that we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but we have, in previous classes, talked about the spirit world, and the spirit world being more real than this world. So it's not too far of a statement to say that both 
first heard the word Sheol, Old Testament, the word Hades, New Testament. The righteous are there and the unrighteous are there. They're not co-mingling together, but they are existing in this plane, in this state. So before you shake your head no to this information, really stop and think about some of the things that you've learned in previous classes. If we think about this in terms of everyone has to die, as the Bible clearly dictates, it's appointed once for man to die in the judgment, then the terms of Hades and Sheol make way more sense than you ever realize. Here's another piece to add to this puzzle. Because 1 Samuel 2.6 says that God brings people there. 1 Samuel 2.6, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. This really blows a lot of people's messages out of the water and the false doctrine that they're teaching that is out will cause you to pull your hair out because you cannot grow worry and well doing it. And the false teaching is that God will never send you to hell. There's a, there's a scripture that just said that God will send you to Sheol. He will send you to Hades. To the place where you're going to be waiting to figure out what's going to happen with you in eternity. As we continue on learning about Sheol, Sheol is a place of the conscience existence after death. Sheol is a place of conscience existence after death. Sheol definitely had negative, foreboding connotations. It was dreaded because it meant the end of physical life on earth and the beginning of an unknown, dark state. Sheol definitely had negative, foreboding connotations. It was dreaded because it meant the end of physical life on earth and the beginning of an unknown, dark state. Deliverance from Sheol was considered a blessing. Sheol was the land of no return, according to Job 16.22. When you think about Hades, Sheol, in these terms, you can see why it would bring up fear and dread. Basically, no one knew what to expect. No one knew what was going to happen to them. You know, all they knew is that they were in this realm. So, it was an unknown place, and once you crossed over, you were not coming back on this side. We know now because God has given us the grace and the wisdom to see what is, is waiting for us and to, to really interpret even more of the scriptures that heaven awaits us. It awaits those who, who are serving him and are living a righteous life. When we look at Shoal, it should not be translated as hell in the sense of ultimate hell. In the sense of the word Gehenna that we talked about earlier. Though all people go to the grave, the souls of some will receive punishment in Sheol. And that punishment can come in the form of, man, you know that it's over with. You know that you, you cannot change your course. You cannot go back into making the right decisions. Just like we read in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus. Or, yeah, the rich man and Lazarus. Sheol should not be translated as hell. In Matthew eleven twenty three, Jesus alluded to Isaiah 14, 13 to 15, using the Greek word Hades. Also, Psalm 16, 10 and Hosea 13, 14 are quoted in the New Testament. Jesus went to Sheol but rose from the grave. This was the foretaste of the resurrection of all believers. Luke 16, 19 to 31 shows two compartments. Ephesians 4, 9 and 10 and 1 Peter 3, 19 refer respectively to the descent of Christ from heaven and his return there. On the very day of death, Jesus promised paradise to the thief on the cross. The Bible does not favor the view of soul sleeping or annihilation of the wicked. Old Testament passage merely assent a well-known fact that each person's body will be buried. 
The Hebrew scriptures do not place too much emphasis on the condition or destiny of men's souls until the resurrection. The development of that theme is left for the New Testament and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which they are very thorough in and made plain. If you say you're, you're going to experience eternal, everlasting punishment. When you look at Hades and Sheol, we want just to caution you when you're looking at these different translations. Make sure you cross reference it to make sure that you're actually looking at the word in Hannah so that you get an understanding of what you're telling other people. <coughs> Excuse me, what you're telling other people. Job 14 13. We're going to look at some scriptures related to uh, Sheol. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. 2 Samuel 22, 6. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Job 11, 8. They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Shall we harvest together in the dust? Shall we have rest together in the dust? Job 26, 6. Sheol is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. Psalm 16, 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. Psalms 18, 5. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Psalms 86, 13. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Psalms 116, 3. The pains of death surrounded me, and the pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Proverbs 1.12 Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, and the whole like those who go down to the pit. Isaiah 5.14 Therefore Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. Isaiah 14, 11. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your string instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. It's kind of getting more and more descriptive as you read each one of these different places. Isaiah 14, 15. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Isaiah 28, 15. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Isaiah 28, 18. Your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the Overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. Isaiah 38 10. I said in the problem of my life, I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. Isaiah 38 18. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope. For your truth. Isaiah 57 9. You went to the king with ointment and increased your perfumes. You sent your messengers far off and even descended to Sheol. Jonah 2 2. And he said, I cried to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. 
I cried and you heard my voice. Think about the different things that we've talked about. This is Old Testament again. How it's it's a waiting place. It's a place where the the dead are there. We're gonna look at some scriptures about Hades. Again, this is the New Testament side. Luke 16, 23. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Matthew eleven twenty three. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, for the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Matthew sixteen eighteen, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Luke ten fifteen, and you Capernaum who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. Acts two twenty seven, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. Acts 2.31 He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ that his soul was not left in Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. First Corinthians 15.55 O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Revelation 1.18 I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Revelation 6 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, in the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed him with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Revelation 20 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Revelations 20.14 Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I'm going to go over one more thing. And this is just a, this is the actual definition of Hades. And this is in the, the Greek. This is 86. Hades, the region of the departed spirits of the lost, again, but including departed believers. We talked about how all of Hades and Sheol tie together. Sheol being Old Testament, Hades being New Testament. As you look at the definitions that we laid out today, it's clear that there's an order that's in the kingdom of God. It's clear that God has set a place for us to go until our final judgment. At this point in time, we're not, sh not seeing anything in these particular scriptures that says you're, well, can't really say that either, because when Jesus was on the cross with the thief, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's another translation for, for Hades itself. So there are good things that are going on in paradise and in Hades. I know it's mind-blowing, yeah, I know it's contrary to what we all have been taught, but the scripture is what the scripture is. And it's interesting when you look at these different things and really put pieces together and see how we all can go down a path that would kind of have you questioning, why does this contradict the one thing that we just learned versus something that we've heard all of our lives? It's not so much as a contradiction as it is a greater truth being revealed and opened up. Because I believe that God wants us to have these truths so that we can give people the truth that come in and talk to us. 
that you see on an everyday basis, and they look at us and they laugh at us because we don't know our Bible. We don't know how to properly discern the things that are in our Bible to be able to help them see. It's not a contradiction. There's, there's a deeper meaning that you have to search out and you have to pull out of it. I just want to thank you all for participating in this class, Training Centers for Exorcisms, class number 44, and we will see you at our next class. Thank you.